sent me to die. We are this morning in between two series of sermons for the summer. We concluded last week the sermon series regarding the Holy Spirit, and we begin next week a sermon series which I will let Dan tell you about when he it returns next Sunday, but a new series begins. So I get to preach the in-between of any scripture passage that I wanted to select. Hence the background. Now the stories. Friends, I have several brief stories of how this scripture about the cleansing of the temple speaks to me in a personal way because I, through my years of ministry and growing up in the church, have experienced being in the temple, as we would call it, in a number of ways. And I would invite you to join with me as we struggle with this passage, trying to understand what we're being taught as Jesus comes and disrupts what is a very religious time in the life of Israel and disrupts a time in which people who are very religious, like you and me, who come and are there at the temple to worship. One story that I have is the struggle over what the church is used for. And I invite you to come with me to a number of cathedrals that I have visited, beautiful cathedrals around our nation and around our world. And as I go into whether it's St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City or as a good subject for this particular um, week of the 4th of July, go into the National Cathedral sometime and notice that as you come into these holy spaces, you look up. You look up at the beauty of what has been created to bring us in together in this, these places that are these sanctuaries where many, many, many people come for worship and to be there in the presence of generations who have come before. You perhaps have gone also to different cathedrals to visit and large churches and come in and you notice the large columns, you notice the arches, you learn more about the different kinds of architecture and the terms of what stained glass windows are about. But I feel guilty because one of the, my favorite um, journeys when I go, one of my favorite uh, activities to do when I come to these cathedrals is to visit what I think our church could have. We could put it right out there in, as you come in the door, a gift shop. <laughs> I love going to the gift shop at some of these cathedrals because you could go in there and not only do they have the postcards and the various souvenirs you can get, the little models that are made in other countries of our cathedrals, and you can get these wonderful gifts to remember your trip to the cathedral, but there are religious gifts that are available. There are icons, there are different types of religious related writings that you can get in the gift shop. But the point is that as I go into the gift shop, there is that little bit of guilt I feel because I remember the story about the cleansing of the temple. And no, of course they don't sell doves and cattle, but they do sell in the temple. If the session would like to take up this, I'll be happy to have a called meeting while Dan is away and we can open the first gift shop. No, that will not work in our polity. But we do enjoy that aspect maybe of these other places that we can visit. I also wrestle with the fact that as we talk about the cleansing of the temple, we so often jump to the conclusion of a physical space, a church, a building, and yet when we go off to camp as our children go, we teach them that the worship of God can happen wherever we may be. There is a wonderful camp down in eastern North Carolina near Laurenburg called Camp Kirkwood. Obviously, in many ways, you may know that the word Kirkwood means in Scottish church in the woods. And so as we go to worship and go off to these retreats, we tell our folks, that our children, that that worship is not exclusively in the temple, the sanctuary. 
Yet that's where Jesus encounters the money changers. Finally, a brief story of where I wrestle with this passage as far as what can happen or cannot happen in the temple or in our sanctuary. I was a new pastor, brand new out of seminary, when our youth decided they wanted to do something for the evening and they seemed to be so excited about this activity. But let me assure you that the next week I was encountered by a number of people who maybe could be Christ incarnate of people who came to me and say, the sanctuary is not where the children should play hide and seek. When I told Mary I was going to mention this in this worship service, she said, please don't mention that because our children have played hide and seek in the sanctuary. Oh, this passage is complicated. But if we want to understand how Jesus is making this personal for us, we remember that the cleansing of the temple is, first of all, a story that challenges us to look at our own faith and to see where cleansing might be necessary. Gerard Sloyan writes that the cleansing of the temple has long been taken as symbolic of the purification of candidates in preparation for their baptism on Easter Eve. In union with the risen Christ, they are to be members of his body, the believing people now becoming a new temple. So perhaps this story is not only about the cleansing of a physical space. Perhaps it is a challenge to us to look within our own lives and to see where maybe we do need to live with more commitment to the one who gives us the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments being about faith in God, about commitment to God's way, maybe what this story does is calls us to look within ourselves and to come back with repentance and confession and to say to Christ that as Christ is within our bodies, we need to cleanse ourselves and be more faithful. Like the money changers and the animal sellers in the temple, we sometimes will wander from God's path. And like them, sometimes we do place our faith more in the ways of the world than in God's way. We might not be guilty of defiling God's sanctuary. However, we are guilty of other sins, the sins of anger, hate, faithlessness, all those sins that separate us from God. And if you come this morning thinking as you hear that, that you're already cleansed, that you are already where God wants you to be and that there's no sin in you, then you're guilty of the sin of pride, hubris. So there's no way to get away from it, you all. We all need cleansing within ourselves. Thankfully, as Christ cleanses the temple, so does he cleanse us. So does Christ offer you and me a new opportunity to begin to be more and more as God would call us to be. As we commit and recommit ourselves to serving for justice, to serving organizations such as so many here in our town that help others, that help those who are hungry, that help foster children, that help the homeless. As we commit ourselves to serving more and doing these things that our church does, such as building 25 beds for children who don't have a bed. As we do these things, we find that our souls, ourselves are cleansed and there's this refreshing feeling that we feel that we are being who God calls us to be as a church. More physically and for immediate purposes, the temple our sanctuary is where we gather for renewal, repentance, 
and reconciliation. This is where we come together to pray. And this is where we come together to learn and to grow in wisdom. Not one person here is born knowing of God's love and the story of God's love in Christ. That story is taught. That story is learned as we grow in the church. And it is wonderful to see so many here coming to this place to grow in wisdom. And this is something else that Christ is teaching us, that the temple, the sanctuary, God's holy space is where we come to grow in wisdom. Because our world is a very complicated place, isn't it? It's so complicated emotionally, spiritually, intellectually, so many complications. We watch all the news on TV, we read the news, and we simply become more confused. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Read the news and be more confused. It's so complicated. And so we come here to church to learn that while theology can be and is complicated, James Zanetti can tell you, you agree with that? Theology is complicated. Our resident professor from Union Seminary would agree with this. It's complicated, but it's not really that complicated. Because when we come here, we come to learn about Christ and his love. And we come remembering that wisdom encompasses all of our entire being, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual. And we come affirming that here at church we do learn about our faith in all those respects. We learn that story of God, the people of Israel, of the prophets, of the judges, of Christ, of the disciples, of Paul, of all the stories that happened with the early Christian church. And then we learn about our story of First Presbyterian Church. So this is what Christ wants us to remember, the true purpose of the church, worship, the true purpose of the church, learning, the true purpose of the church, commitment, and the people there in the temple exchanging their money and buying these um, animals to sacrifice. They have lost sight and do not understand that the very embodiment of who God is is in Jesus Christ, and they think they can get right with God through these sacrifices. And Jesus is trying to teach us, come to me and I am the way and the truth. Christ provides us with an example of what going to the temple should be about. He goes to the temple at an early age. He causes his parents a lot of frustration because he gets, stays there to talk to the rabbis when they go home and they think that he's lost and they come and he's there in the temple. And Luke concludes writing, Jesus increased in wisdom and in years there at the temple. Throughout his ministry, Jesus understands himself as a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies, and he affirms God's will and purpose for his life as he lives through the years of teaching who God is. And this understanding and wisdom are often achieved through his teaching and learning at the temple. The temple is the place where we come to remember with thankful heart the gift of salvation that we have in Jesus, God's only son. This wonderful story talks about Jesus saying this phrase that in three days he will raise up the temple. And all of this imagery is about the 
understanding Jesus has of what's about to happen in his crucifixion. This is the only place in John where Jesus talks about his crucifixion before it even happens. So as we read this, we realize that what Jesus is talking about is that God is now becoming embodied in him. He is the living temple. And not only that, but each one of us is the embodiment of God out there to the world. That, my friends, is what I want us to especially remember today. You and I are the embodiment of God and Jesus Christ to the world. So in that sense, we are the temple of God, within us is God. And this is why we talk about how important it is for us in our lives to live as God calls us to live. To speak as people of God would speak and Christ would have us to speak. When we are angry, to pray to God to help us to be calm. When we are proud, to pray to God to help us to be humble. When we are lazy, raise your hands if you're ever lazy, and you want to just sleep in on that Sunday morning, remember, friends, God says, remember the Sabbath day and come rest in the temple. No, I won't change it that way. But the fact is, God does call us to keep the Sabbath day holy. And that involves us coming to church. And I thank God to look around this church on a hot summer day of the 4th of July week to see how full our sanctuary is. And it's wonderful to see especially so many of you all who are younger, all of us older. It's good to see you all too. But it's nice on a summer day to see some of our younger folks. Friends, the cleansing of the temple is about the Pharisees and Sadducees, but it's really a story about you and me.